Hey everyone, Salty here. Uh, just checking up on you guys. Um, and this is basically just a little disclaimer. I mean, not even a disclaimer. It's just like a... It's your context of what the video is you're about to see. So, this was a, a school project I had. Um, it was a year-long project, and it's just about video games. That didn't have to make it about games, but I did. So, um... What's important is that I put a bunch of work into this, and it was my first big project ever that was that had to do with filmmaking. I had dabbled in it before, but nothing like this. So, I'm proud of it. The audio is uh, pretty horrendous past, like, three minutes. It's weird. And the visuals um, don't look great, so uh, it, could, it could just use a lot of work. Um, if this video gets enough support, and if you guys really like this, I will redo the voiceover for it, and I will clean up the visuals, maybe, um, and re-upload that, and, um, see if you guys like it, so, yeah, make sure to drop a like, uh, maybe comment on the video if you really liked it, just to show me that you, you know, want me to, you know, well, I guess remaster it in sorts, um, so yeah, without further ado, there's the video, um, bam. Video games have been around for nearly five decades. Throughout time, they have evolved from humble beginnings in the pixel like in 1970s to the ultra-realistic 4K resolution we see today. There is a long history related to them, with trials and tribulation in abundance throughout. Many people's entire childhood revolve around the video games they had as a kid. There are those whose entire careers are founded entirely upon this form of home entertainment. There is a reason why there are countless courses dedicated to the creation and design of these games. Video games were, and still are, very important. Time and time again, they've broken the demanding home entertainment barriers with the evolution of graphics, gameplay, design, sound, music, and genres throughout history. The 1970s are what many consider to be the birth of video games. The graphics were crude and rudimentary, the gameplay is also often basic, and the sounds were rarely more than beat with varying pitches. Despite all of this, they sold. Parents bought their kids the new Atari 2600 with a new ColecoVision. Perhaps Santa gave kids the new television for Christmas. It didn't matter what they got though, because most of these games were largely the same. Most games were just pixels on the screen. This meant that the imagination of the human mind was able to run wild. Take Pong, for instance, which is a game that is simply digital ping pong. The graphics, quite literally, consist of squares. Even though these video games are crude, from a very early age, they started to refine. Take, for instance, the Atari 2600 game Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back. It is a simple game where you play as Luke Skywalker during the Battle of Hoth. Your goal is to take down the Adat Walkers marching towards the rebel base by shooting them. Even though it's old, the design is excellent. The view is on the side, focused on the X-Wing, which is a good choice. Flying feels natural and controls easily, thanks to well-programmed physics. And the Adat Walkers have a lot of variables that go into how you battle them. Mind you, this is all contained inside of a game that plays in the Atari 2600. In the history of gaming, the 1980s began with darkness. In 1983, the video game market crashed, and any game consoles took a dump in sales because the price of anything related to them rose. In many's eyes, the market was dead, and it seemed as though these wonderful platforms for developers to create their grandchildren on was going to become a small footnote in the history of home entertainment. However, from the ashes rose two new contenders, Nintendo and Sega. These two companies revived the industry, and sales started booming once again. In 1988, Time Magazine published an article titled Nintendo Scores Big, which is about Nintendo sales booming, being in the 900,000s. The Nintendo Entertainment System had a large catalog of games, ranging from platformers to shoot 'em ups, and the Sega Genesis was no different, only it had 16 bit graphics. As a matter of fact, Sega used this graphics advantage as a marketing campaign. The commercial Genesis does is a testament to this. Genesis does! 16 bit arcade graphics. You can't do this on Nintendo! Genesis does! 
16-bit sports action. You can't do this on Nintendo Genesis. Joe Montana free, Pat Riley free, Buster Douglas free, Super Monaco GP free, or Collins free. What Nintendo? The competition was always fierce between these two companies, which is why video games kept evolving over time. They had to come up with new and interesting ideas, such as how the Legend of Zelda, on a tactically inferior NES, had a save system. In another instance, while Sonic and Knuckles had two different storylines, which character you picked, the different gameplay mechanics for each. It is truly amazing just how these companies strive to be greater than the other, in turn forcing them to come up with new ways to compete. There are plenty of examples that showcase this progression of game mechanics. For instance, in the Mega Man series, originally in the NES, there was a choice involved with the progression of the game because you could pick which stage you started out on. There were eight stages you could choose from, all with different niches to them. This freedom of choice added an interesting dynamic, personal strategy to the experience. The 1990s were great for video games, because there was a lot of progression during this time period. From the start of the decade to the end of it, there was no shortage of innovation here, prominent figure in this decade is what is called the Bit Wars, where in bits are the graphics quality of the game. It is undeniable that in the 1980s, Sega had a clear upper hand over Nintendo in terms of graphics, but in November of 1990, Nintendo gave their answer to Sega, the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. A common trend found in the titles of these games is part of the console title. Transition from the NES to the SNES is spectacular, not only from a gameplay standpoint, but also from a technical standpoint. Right off of the bat, the SNES has 8 times the RAM the NES has, which was upgraded to 128 kilobytes. On top of that, the improved console launched for 32,758 colors on screen, versus the 62 the NES allowed. That's nearly 630 times the colors. While the NES allowed for 8x16 sprites, the NES allows for 64x64-bit sprites. With resolution increased, the amount of video RAM increased, and everything overall jumped up the quality. Sega didn't change the Sega Genesis, and instead they came out with a Sega CD, which was a flop. Innovation, as we've previously discovered, is common in the 1990s. Game designers liked to experiment with game styles and new designs, and this experimentation created new game genres, the likes of which people had never seen. One of these game genres would be the first-person shooters, which was something completely new to people. Games like Doom, Quake, and Wolfenstein 3D, the first of their time. In the same light, on the Nintendo 64, you had GoldenEye 07, Doom 64, Perfect Dark. Switch to the Nintendo 64 itself was also drastic. Although the hardware was great for its time, the real game changer was the 3D graphics. Although polygons were present on the SNES, such as in Super Star Fox, they began to take real form on the N64. Games in 3D blew the minds of many. However, because they were also a relatively new concept, the controls were never perfected fully. There was no handbook on how to make good 3D controls. Still, the N64 is a highly notable innovation in video game history. The history of home entertainment has had a lot of big names in its history, but none but the titan we know today as video games. In the 1970s, video games are still taking their baby steps, with simple mechanics and graphics that leave an empty space for the imagination to fill. Not much happened, but it was the start of something great. In the 1980s, the market crashed, and it seemed as though the industry was dead. So Nintendo and Sega rose from the ashes. It was here that things started to evolve, because of the everlasting battle between the two companies to be better than the counterparts. In the 1990s, designers started to experiment with new ideas and concepts, driven by competition and the horizon of new technology. 
It was here that modern games and unique genres started to take form, beginning to end. In conclusion, games have always had to break barriers, because it was mandatory for their survival.